Why doesn't a good God stop a bad virus? That's the question I want to explore with you this morning. And if you're watching because someone has particularly sent on the links to you and invited you to do so, or in perhaps in invited you around to their lounge room to watch the service with them, I'm so glad that you're here and I hope that what is said might be stimulating for you. This is our traditional service. I'm in the church up at Blaney this morning. We enjoy a couple of traditional hymns and the traditional service of morning prayer. And we begin with, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. What a great and marvellous hymn, and I hope it's brought joy to your heart this morning. I particularly love the line that he breaks the power of cancelled sin. And so it is that we read that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 
Oh, dear friends, the scriptures urge us to acknowledge our sins and not to conceal them from God, our Heavenly Father, but to confess them with a penitent and obedient heart so that we may be forgiven through his boundless goodness and mercy. We ought always to admit our sins before God and especially when we come together to give thanks for the good things we have received at his hands, to offer the praise that is his due, to hear his holy word and to ask that which is necessary for the body as well as the soul. Therefore, let us draw near to the throne of our gracious God and pray together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared in Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant, most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live godly, righteous and sober lives, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has no pleasure in the death of sinners, but would rather they should turn from their wickedness and live. And he has given authority to his ministers to declare to his people who repent the forgiveness of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and believe his holy gospel. And so we ask him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that what we do now may please him and that the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, so that at the last, we might come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips and we shall declare your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. And we praise the Lord in the words of Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he heard my voice, the voice of my supplication, because he inclined his ear to me in the day that I called to him. How shall I repay the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Grievous in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant, your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have unloosed my bonds. I will offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord even in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The first reading is from Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected, subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Hear the word of the Lord. 
Now, let's say the Te Deum together. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you as the Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, the cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you, Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all praise, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Lord Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you took our flesh to set us free, you humbly chose the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death, and open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come to be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. The Holy Gospel is written in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, beginning at the 35th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Je Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's the most natural question in the world to have asked. Have you asked it? Why doesn't a good God stop a bad virus? I'm sure you, like me, were disturbed when you began to see pictures of the mass graves being dug overseas, hear the figures in Spain and Italy, UK, USA, Brazil, India, uh, the impact that was having on lives, on livelihoods around our globe was disturbing. And of course, it's not only the deaths that we think of. Uh, many who are sick are still sick and will suffer long-term implications from having received the virus. Then there's the economic uh, implications, the job losses, the shutdowns, the businesses that have gone out of business, the impact on the education sector and on the travel industry. And of course, those economic implications are never merely economic. They take its toll in terms of downturn in income and relationships, families under pressure, increase in domestic violence, increase in the race, rate of suicide. And all of this causes us to ask God this question. It seems very reasonable to ask God, why? Why have you allowed this to happen? Why didn't you stop it at the start? Why haven't you intervened? Why don't you intervene right now? Well, friends, there are some, some things that we cannot know and some things that we can know. So I want to start with what we can know. And that means taking a step back so that we see the big picture. And here's where I want to start by asking, what's wrong with the world? The world started perfectly when God created it. Our relationship with God, perfect. 
People loved, worshipped and obeyed God as they were created to do. Our relationship with one another, there was understanding, there was communication, there was love, there was no struggle with identity and anxiety and depression or addiction. Uh, and we were God's resident managers of his creation and everything was perfect there too. We did our job well. But it doesn't take us long to realise that that is not the way the world is now. And the scenes of these last couple of weeks have made that abundantly clear. Uh, the riots, the recession, the murder. Uh, we look at situations in the Middle East and Nigeria, the Sudan, the Congo and Syria. The world is in a mess and it's been a me in a mess for a long time. Now why? What happened to God's good creation? Because humankind rejected God. We are, we are made for a relationship with him, and yet we are capable of refusing. In the most rebellious human act ever committed, men and women stepped outside of God's ordained plan and decided to do things instead their own way. And in an instant, fear and guilt and shame became human standard experiences. Rather than submit to God's authority, people became their own gods. And the Bible tells us that the nature, whole nature of the world was thrown into chaos when as a whole humans decided to do their own things, their own thing. The impact on the whole of creation was massive and profound. The entire universe was impacted deeply by the outfall of mankind's rebellion against God. There is a confronting connection in the Bible between our rebellion against God and disorder and upheaval in creation itself, from the DNA in our human body to the shifting of tectonic plates beyond, uh, under the earth. So alongside the beauty of our world, uh, around us we also see ugliness, a certain disorder. And that means that bad things happen to all people, good and bad, more on that next week, bad things happen to people all the time. From earthquakes and tsunamis and cyclones to bushfires and cancer and MS and Parkinson's disease and coronaviruses and corona, cor uh, coronavirus 19. The world is not as it was created to be because of mankind's rebellion. It's seriously mucked up and it's badly flawed. It's lost its way. Every time you hear of a death or a loss, a sadness, a grief, or a war, a disaster, a famine, a black man killed by a white police officer, a pandemic. When you confront the excesses of drugs and alcohol, when you, when you head off for a funeral, when you face the challenges and aches and pains of old age, when you face someone's temper, when someone offends or mistreats you, all of those are the effects of the mucked up world in which we live. And we read from Romans 8 that not only do we groan because of such things, but the whole creation groans, waiting for God to do something about it. The reality is that we are all both victims of and contributors to human evil. And I know all too well the evil desires of my own heart. And perhaps you know the evil desires of yours as well. So the question is, what is God's plan? Let's look secondly at God's grand plan. Do you know God's reaction at the rebellion of the human race? Here's what we read very early on in the Bible from Genesis 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted or was grieved that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. The inclination of the human heart, only evil all the time. God was grieved and deeply troubled. Wouldn't you be? And our first question is, well, then why doesn't God do something about it? And the answer is that in the books of the Bible, because the Bible is a library of books, in the books of the Bible, after about chapter three of the very first book, the rest of the entire Bible 
spells out God's plan to answer the rebellion of the human race, to do something about evil and suffering, about death and dying. What is his plan? So radical is it that the Bible describes it as a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth. Yes, this one is destined to come to an end. And what will the new one be like? Well, think of everything that you love about this creation. Um, perhaps you love the ocean or perhaps you love the mountains or the, or the plains. Uh, perhaps the, your favourite thing about this world in which we live is the, the finest joy of a beautiful, perfected relationship with another human being. Perhaps it's something from the animal world that you love. Think of everything that you love about this world and multiply it thousands of thousands of times. That's what the new creation will be like, minus everything you loathe about this world. What is it that you loathe? Warring and fighting and death and disease and cruelty and bitterness and hate, hate and revenge and decay and fractured relationships and COVID-19. Minus any of that, the new creation will have none of that, not even a tiny fraction. It will be completely wiped out, dealt with and gone. So God grieved that he had made mankind, hurt by their evil, has a grand plan to wipe out all evil, to bring this creation to an end and replace it with a new creation. That's God's grand plan. But how will it be that rebellious people such as me will be able to find themselves in relationship with God once more? Through the life and death of Jesus, who lived the perfect life that we can't live and died the death that we deserve. Our rebellion was put on Jesus' shoulders. The impact of all human evil over all time. It sent Jesus to his grave. And yet God's power is greater than all the world's evil. And so he rose Jesus from the dead and conquered death and evil as he did so. So that humankind could come back clean, reconciled into a relationship with him. And through Jesus' death and resurrection, which, has, which is at the center of human history, God declares his victory over all evil. And we look now for Jesus' return as the final brick in the plan to replace this world with the new creation. Let me anticipate then the most obvious question. What is he waiting for? That is, if he's going to wind up the world and do away with all evil and its implications, why not get on and do it? And the only part of the Bible that seems to suggest, suggest an answer is this one from 2 Peter chapter 3. Do not forget this one, dear, one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So the Lord does not work in our time frame. He is out of time. He is in eternity. And so what might seem slow to us is not slow to him. And the longer it takes within time for God to wind things up, then that passage makes clear that there is more opportunity for many people to come into a relationship with him. He longs that everyone should give up their rebellion and come back to him and build her again, a beautiful relationship of trust and love. Maybe he's longing for you today for that to happen, for you to turn back and to find a new, fresh start with him. He doesn't want you to die without knowing him. He doesn't want to exclude you from the new creation because you're still busy with your back turned to him. So come back to him today. That's my invitation. And find yourself forgiven and reconciled and then, then living with the hope that you will have a place in God's grand new creation. Well, that's the big picture. It, it doesn't answer all our questions, doesn't it? does it? It doesn't satisfy all our dilemmas. 
So my final question is, what, what do we do in the meantime? A toddler is run over in a driveway. A man killed by police in brutal circumstances. COVID-19 out of control, with hundreds of thousands killed and economic upheaval everywhere. Why don't you stop that sort of thing happening, God, while we wait for the new creation? I get that we're waiting for that to happen, but why, why don't you stop some stuff now? And the answer is, I don't fully understand. I don't fully know. My understanding is that God can do what he wants. He can and does move in human hearts in various ways. But let me ask you, what kind of world would we be living in if God overrode our will all the time? What if every time a, a crook wanted to pull a trigger on a gun or a husband wanted to be unfaithful to his wife or a businesswoman wanted to withhold her resources from the poor? What if God stepped in and overrode their will every time? What kind of world would we stop in? Would we, would we be living in? What if every time I wanted to keep all my money to myself, I found myself giving it away? What happened when you wanted to raise your voice at your spouse, you were strangely silenced? What would happen if you went to look on something that you shouldn't at the, on the internet and your modem disintegrated? What happens if you wanted to toot your horn impatiently at a driver in front of you and you found your left hand strangely paralysed? You see, asking why doesn't God step in and stop the evil raises all sorts of other questions. You might say to me, well, Mark, not all the small stuff. I don't mean that. Just the really serious stuff. But where would you draw the line? Anywhere, just somewhere before it got to impacting you? What sort of world would it be if God stopped all the evil all the time? We might not be asking the question, why does God allow evil? But we might ask the more difficult philosophical question, why doesn't God allow us choice? Why don't we have any will? If God was simply and profoundly to stop all evil now, then I wouldn't be standing here preaching. And you wouldn't be sitting there listening. So in the meantime, we can't know all the answers. We don't know all the answers. But we do know this, that in our suffering, he is with us. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. So when we do face challenges, when we are perhaps impacted by COVID-19 and all its implications, we run to God as our refuge because he's promised to be that. We draw strength from his strength and we know that he is ever present with us in our time of need. And we know that our God knows suffering and loss and evil. He was persecuted in the person of his son. He was beaten and whipped and went to the cross. He knew losses and sadnesses and bereavements in his life. He knows what we're going through. We can run to him. We can find that he understands. He is with us in all the challenges that we face. So even though the way is hard, we put our small hand, as it were, into his big hand. We know that he loves us so much that he's given us his son, Jesus Christ, and therefore he's completely and utterly for us and on our side. So we put our small hand into, our, into his big hand and say, I trust you. I don't know what's going on. I, I don't like what's going on. I don't understand what the future holds, but I trust you and I'm going to walk with you day by day. Well, why doesn't a good God stop a bad virus? To answer, we take a step back and we realise that a good world has been thrown into chaos because we were called to obey, but we are capable of refusing. And when humanity at large refused at that moment, the whole world was not what it once was. The whole universe became a twisted, distorted version of its former self. But God promises a new day, a day of justice, a day of comfort, a day of restoration, a day when he will bring in his new creation and all that is magnificently good about this world will be multiplied a thousand times and all that we loathe and hate and breaks our heart about this world will be gone and gone forever. And so we await that great day 
but we wait it with hope and patience. Placing our small hand into God's big hand and saying, I'm so glad you're with me. I don't understand everything that's happening, but I'm so glad you're here. And we run to him as our refuge and our strength and our very present help. Amen. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We begin our prayers with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord, show us your mercy and grant us your salvation. Keep our nation under your care and guide us in justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and make your chosen people joyful. Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, for you are our help and strength. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew us by your Holy Spirit. The Collect for the Second Sunday after Pentecost. All-powerful God, in Jesus Christ you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us by your mighty power and grant that we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but lead and govern us in all things, that we may always do what is righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're privileged to have an anthem this morning, Hear Our Prayer, sung by the Tapestry Group from Parks.
we continue now in prayer, let us firstly respond to the message that we've heard this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of coming to you in prayer and sharing with you the desires of our heart. We acknowledge that we live in a broken world, marked up because of humanity's rejection of you as God, which had a profound impact on all creation. We grieve all that was lost because humankind decided to go it alone without you. Thank you that because you love us, you stepped into our world in the person of Jesus to conquer evil, to make it possible for us to be reconciled to you and for you to bring in a new heavens and a new earth. As we wait for that great day, help us to run to you as our refuge, to draw strength from your strength and to know that you are with us through our challenges. Please hasten the day when evil will be put down, when injustice is righted, and we live in your presence forever in the new creation. Amen. For our world. We pray for our world, Lord God, so deeply impacted by COVID-19 and the economic impact of lockdown. We pray for those countries still battling rising infection and death rates. May their leaders respond well and make wise decisions for the good of their people. Here in Australia, we thank you that although we are dealing with the economic downturn and unemployment, we have been left relatively unscathed by the virus itself. May those who have been infected continue to make a recovery. And those who have lost much loved family members, know your comfort and peace. We pray that by your kindness, life will return to a relative normal soon, especially asking that we might soon get back to church in a manner which is manageable and feasible. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we pray for those who are taking part in this service today, who are watching this service, <coughs> who are new to all this, or perhaps are exploring coming back to you after having been away for a time. Please give them a desire to know more about Jesus. Help them to come with all their doubts and scepticism, yet with open hearts, willing to consider new possibilities about you, about Jesus, about the Bible and about your people. Help us to welcome them and offer whatever help we can as they explore the truth about Jesus. May they know your love for them in a new and fresh way. Amen and for those sick or struggling. Finally, Lord, we pray for those in our churches or our families who are doing it tough right now, struggling with illness or anxiety or loneliness. Please strengthen them. Where it is your will, please heal them. But above all, give them grace to keep trusting you, even though the way is hard. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petitions of those who ask in your Son's name. Mercifully accept us who have now made our prayers to you and grant us those things which we have asked in faith according to your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, it has been lovely to have you with us today, especially if you've been particularly invited by a friend or a neighbour to watch the service or to join them in their living room to watch the service. It's so wonderful. I'm so glad that you've come. Perhaps you've come because of the question that I was posing, why doesn't a good God stop a bad virus? And if the sermon, if the talk has raised issues for you, or perhaps just sparked some extra curiosity, then I want to commend to you the opportunity to take the Jesus Explained course that I'll be running in July. It'll run on Tuesdays in July, uh, either at 4pm, you take your choice, 4pm or 7.15pm. And if you email jesusexplained at gmail.com and let me know that you'd like to come or perhaps ask a couple of questions about it, then I'd love uh, to register you. I can take 20 in each of those two groups. 
So please do come along via Zoom and join us for, those, for that course. I'm sure you'll find it helpful as we investigate who Jesus is, why he came and what difference he makes in our lives. We're going to finish with this beautiful hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, because when we understand that in his love for us, Jesus came and died and rose again for us, then our response, as the hymn picks up, is to give him our everything, our all. When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, coming to us from St Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney. peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.